Hello. I think. Right, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm glad you, could, you still made it and that not everyone ran away before the final and the greatest. No, OK, that's not a good start. We practiced this, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but OK, uh, so we're here to tell you about monitoring ACA. So how does one go about writing monitoring software? And what we're going to show you is the project that we had to make to scratch our own itch for one of our clients. So completely open source monitoring tool that you can use for your ACA application. So let's see what it, what it looks like inside. And what's the motivation, Alex? Yeah, so if I can work the mouse. There we go. OK. <laughs> so the idea is what, you know, what do we want to monitor? You know, what's monitoring all, all about? The idea is that you want to get more insight into the performance and the flow of your application. Um, allowing us to see pain points and pressure points um, and areas of generally poor performance in the app. Um, increasing the visibility, um, you know, everyone aims for a 24-7 uptime, nobody wants downtime. Um, you just want to prevent the big boom. Yeah, absolutely. So, so one of the things that our clients said, they went, so how about you just monitor for the HTTP 500s? So when stuff starts going wrong, that's when you're going to do something. Well, actually, it's a bit too late, right? What you would like to see is that something is about to go wrong. Uh, your actors are getting overloaded. Maybe there's a, the messages are spending too much time sitting in a queue. Maybe you're running out of memory because the queues are big. Something to allow you to react before the bad thing happens. And so that's one of the motivations for proper monitoring. So if you get it right, you'll be reactive. Wait a minute. Resilient. What's the other thing? Who knows, right? So you'll be reactive. You'll be event-driven, you'll be resilient, you'll be responsive, and you'll be scalable. But to be that, you need to know when to scale, when to react to things. So, second aspect of proper monitoring is this thing, right? And I suppose I'm just as guilty of that, having developed something on my machine, my development machine, my virtual machines that run all the components, and then I go, okay, your problem now. I'm not going to tell you everything that I figured out. I'm not going to tell you all the details of my setup. It's for you to figure out. You are the dev guys. You are the ops guys, right? Come on. So yeah, are, are you ready for production is the, is the big question. So here at Scholar Days, we've seen some great talks. I'm sure you're all itching to get back to your machines and write you know, the next Facebook, Netflix, you know, whatever your great idea is. Um, but what, what do you do when you've um, wrote that bit of code? And you, you, know, you need to see um, what's happening. You know, Acker is a and play and the, the TypeSafe platform are a great tool set. Um, but you know, it's not a, a, the, the golden ticket. It's, you know, it doesn't solve all of your woes when running in production. Um, you still need to keep an eye on the stack and you need to see what's, you know, what's going on. So you want to see what's, you know, what's going on inside the application. So are the hotspots in our uh, active system? Are there too many, queues on the, on the, too many messages on the queue? You know, are the queues getting too big? Um, are, are they spending too long on the, um, in the queues? Um, you know, do, we, do we have enough threads? Are the threads being utilized? You know, are we making the most of the, you know, even though hardware is cheap, you still want to make the most of, your, you know, of the, the units that you pay for in Amazon or your favorite cloud provider? Not quite right. Um, so yeah, more right. visibility. Absolutely. So here, here is the thing that we started with the project with our client. We said, okay, here is the minimum things that we want to monitor. So this was a large price aggregation system. So you make a, a request and you say, I want to get a car to go from Berlin to Manchester. That would be a fancy car. But OK, suppose you have that. Now, the question is, you will get responses from all the different providers that come back with a price and some you know, conditions of the rental. So one HTTP request from a client, 50 HTTP requests out to the provider. We thought, what do we need to know to keep this thing running? So we looked at it and went, hmm, number and the rates of messages. How many messages per second are we receiving? Um, what are the sizes of the queues? What's the duration of the message? What's the total time to execute the receive function in, in the actors? Do we have any failures? So we want to record exceptions. And we want to record as much as we know about it, including the flow of the message through the system. So what happened before we threw some sort of exception? And finally, the threads in the thread pools. Because, OK, we had a good bunch of reactive code, but there was a lot of 
legacy stuff. There was a lot of blocking calls because of the third party dependencies that we had, that the client had. So how do we keep an eye on that? And we thought, we're type safe. You know, we know the type safe guys. We thought, this is it, right? They've already solved it. Job done, let's go home. Although, it didn't quite go that way. Um, the type safe console is great, actually. You know, it, it's, it's really good. Um, it's got a great UI. Um, you know, it looks great, but under load, sales pitch. Yeah. <laughs> under load, it was just not performing. Um, it was just unstable. There was too much data. Um, you know, when we started putting performance loads in, you know, that crash, it'd be trying to chuck out all this data. And it was just not usable in production. But, you know, on the plus note, development purposes, it was great. It, for, for the first time I used the Type Safe console, it, it gave a, a good look and you could follow you know, the messages through the Active System. You could see what's going on. So I definitely recommend it for developers to get a better understanding of your system and so you can you know, get a visual and a, a clickable sort of representation of, of how your systems work. Absolutely. So, so here we were, right? Type Safe console, we, did a, we tried it, we killed it with our load test. So what do we do next? Uh, we looked around and we talked to the client and they went, well, actually, we already have uh, our internal monitoring tool. It all runs over StatsD. So we thought, hmm, I wonder if we could do something. So we rolled our own project. We called it Monitor, which is a bit terrible name. So we called it Reactive Monitor now. This is far better. Job done. Anything, any problem, stick Reactive in front of it. It's got <laughs> a great name. So, yeah. Absolutely. So, so if anyone's stuck for names, talk to me and I'll recommend Reactive. Anyhow, so we decided to keep an eye on just the bare minimum that we wanted to see for this particular system. And so we record actor creation and destruction. By destruction, I mean stopping of an actor. Mm -hmm. We record, go on. The message types, you yep. know, message rates, failures, you know, performance at an actor level. Um, we look at the queues, uh, you know, the, the local actor queues, the, the act the <laughs> at a local level, the number of available and running threads in the thread pools. You know, that sort of information just gives you enough to see what, you know, what's going on. Yes, yeah, so this is, again, this is after you've tuned the system in development, perhaps using the TypeSafe console, so you really understand how the messages are flowing. And now you're in a position where you can deploy it in production. It's stable enough as far as you can tell, right? Worked in dev. But you still need to keep an eye on anything that could be possibly going wrong. And this is a good way to start. Right, enough of general introduction, right? So let's have a look <laughs> at what we've done. As I said, we started with StatsD, but we talked to the client and they were making noises along the way of what if we change our mind? We might not stick with StatsD all the time. So we've divided our reactive monitor into two big components. We have the agents that actually collect uh, the, the, the metric data, the metrics data, and we have outputs that send the data at the minute to StatsD, Dtrace, and CodeHales metrics. We're trying to, we will definitely try to do some more system level, really Linux system level logging, uh, but Dtrace is a good start anyway, so you can see that. And the agents can instrument ACA, so actor creation, destruction, messages. They can instrument play to deal with your HTTP requests. How many are you getting? Are you getting any errors? How long do they take to serve? And spray, which is the same thing. How many requests are we getting? What's the total request response time? and what's the throughput in bytes. So how much IO am I generating in bytes per second? So here is what we, imagine this, right? This is to get to the code. Imagine you have such a simple thing, two actors, I, I won't really give details of X and Y, but suppose they react to these strings and integers. So the question here is, what could we monitor using our monitoring tool perhaps, and what would we like to monitor? So, go on, the grand result. Well, now, come on, guys. What, what, what would you like to monitor? Let's make it interactive. Come on. Anybody, what would we like to see? The message yeah. got there, yeah. Mailbox sizes. Mailbox yeah. sizes, good. That we have, um, I don't know, that we have two actors. Failed messages, absolutely. Right, okay, so we have good tips. So here's, here's an example that we pulled out as a... We, we, we monitor a lot more, but here's a, here's a quick stab at it. So, yeah. complicated so, chart. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a very difficult thing to try and represent it graphically, isn't it? But we'll have a go. So, you know, the, the number of types of actors. So, we've got, you know, the, there's, there's two actors. The messages. So, there's 
a message going grouped by the actor. So there's a, you know, an, an, int, uh, an int message going to the, the X actor and you know, an int and a string message going to the Y actor. So a total of three messages going across the system. Um, the thread pool, so you know, the total size of the thread pool, you know, the number of active threads within that pool, um, and performance, sort of, throughput. Right, so this is a subset of what we all monitor. But remember, this is monitoring of the three messages that we sent to the actor system. And here's another thing that, when we constructed this monitoring tool, that we wanted to keep in mind. By then, we've already written quite a lot of code. And so what we thought is, we'd like to keep the code exactly the same. We don't want to write anything else. This is what we want. We have loads of it. We don't really want to touch it. So, what do we do? I mean, this, this was the thing, right? Exactly. So the, the core thing was that, you know, we don't want to touch our source. The source is, you know, tested. We don't want to litter it with, um, you know, monitoring. Absolutely. So, so macros to the rescue, right? We'd use macros. No. No, we, we didn't use macros. We used something worse. We used the evil twin of a macro. Yeah. Unfortunately, we weaved stuff in. So has anyone, has anyone heard of Aspect J? Yay, there we go. Fantastic. So we don't have to explain too much. Yeah. But in any case, just all of, so... All of the burnt fingers raised. <laughs> yeah, that, was, that was very good. But, um... Those who don't, let's, let's walk through it. Yeah, so... You know, a quick one-on-one of Aspect J. Aspect J. There's, there's two types of Aspect J. So you have compile time weaving. So that allows you to instrument your um, bytecode um, at compile time with bits of monitoring. So that, oh, sorry, with bits of code so that you can add in uh, and do things. And then the alternative to that is load time weaving. So you can have a separate configuration uh, of, of code and, and wrap that code around certain um, aspects and um, cut points in the, in the, right, cut, absolutely. In the code. So, so you write your aspects, which represent the functionality that you want to inject, and then you have a Java inst, Java agent, that bytecode recompiles the classes as they are loaded from disk, and injects your instrumentation code in. So, I mean, that, that's the definition of a virus, right? That's exactly what we do. We have something on disk, we modify it slightly, and the stuff that ends up in memory is something slightly different. Nevertheless, this is a way of, that allowed us to keep the ACA source code untouched. We didn't want to roll our own ACA. Yeah. And we also wanted to support, throughout the life cycle of the project, we wanted to stick to ACA 2.1, then 2.2, and 2.3. So we needed something that can instrument all of the three things. And as we have more things like play and spray, again, we need it, needed a way to leave all the dependencies untouched and to just write the monitoring code. So, here's how it works. You start the Java process, and you give it a, a Java agent command line parameter, which points to an aspect J weaver. So that's the, that's the bad stuff. That's the guy that actually does the bytecode manipulation. And what it roughly looks like, imagine you have a method there that's called preprocess, that is given the bytes of the class that's loaded by a class loader, and its job is to spit new bytes out. There are the new class that with the functionality injected. And in rough outline, this is exactly what we do. There's a class called AJ that extends class preprocessor, name suggests what it's going to do. And when, we, when the class loader loads the class from disk or from somewhere, it modifies its bytecode. So that might be one answer that to you know, any, any preemptive questions the performance hit is at load time. So when your application starts, that's when we recompile the stuff. But we'll show you a way in which we can restrict the amount of bytecode man manipulation that we end up doing. And that's on this slide. Ta-da. So yeah, so um, to turn on load time weaving, um, you, you add this uh, Java argument to, to your run command, uh, and you create this AOP XML, so I'm sure lots of people would have seen that before. But um, the, the AOP XML tells the weaver where to <laughs> unleash its monkey patching magic, you know, release the monkeys. Um, in other words, we restrict the scope um, to work where the weaver has to do. So we try to um, keep the monkey patching as, as little as possible. Right, absolutely, because you don't, again, we don't ship this AOP XML in the monitor jars. So you actually have to create it in your app because we want to sort of leave the control over to you. If you decide to 
only monitor maybe the actor cells and you're not interested in dispatch monitoring, don't include that actor. And again, you can restrict the class hierarchies where you want the monkey patching to happen. You know, a big class path with a lot of dependencies would take a lot of time. So this is a nice way to restrict the amount of work and the amount of damage that can happen. All right. So here is the Aspect J language. I'm going to show two things. I won't really get into too much of the gory details because there's just too many of them. But here's an example of monitoring of the receive message call in an actor cell. So the unfortunate thing is that, well, this method really isn't available to you in the Scala API. You shouldn't be able to touch it. This is private to Akka. But we do need it for the performance monitoring and for actually recording that we have delivered a message that um, we measure how long the receive partial function takes. But what you're seeing here is that we inject code around the target method. So imagine that the, blue com that the green comments above proceed happen before the receive method happens and that the return null would do comment happens after. And this is, this is exactly what's happening. So it is a copy and paste of code, if you like, into all the locations that are identified by call to actor cell dot receive message. And we're able to extract the instance on which it is being called, the actual actor object, and we're able to extract the message. So that's the thing that arrived to you. Uh, another example, and this is a slightly shorter one, but there are plenty more um, advices and point cuts in the code, and you're free to have a look. Um, this is a before advice. So this is code that we've patched in front of the call to Java Util Concurrent Executive Service Execute. And again, we can pull out the executive service and examine it. You know, we can say, well, how many threads are there? How many active threads are there? Anything else that we can find out. But when this code finishes its job, the target proceeds. There, we can't stop it. I mean, technically, we could throw runtime error or do sys exit, but you know, something normal doesn't allow us to stop the code to proceed to the executive service execute. So that, that's all we're going to show around aspect J. It is, like I said, it's the, the evil twin of macros. Um, but we had to write it because we wanted to keep compatible with the versions of Akka and, pray, and Spray and Play without having to make our own modifications. And then, of course, keep up the modified versions with the developments of Akka and Spray. We do have to keep up, though, with the internal naming. So if the Akka team comes in and decides to change, execute, or actually, no, execute would be difficult to change, but decides to change receive yeah, message yeah. to something else, we have to modify the code. But it's our job. It's nothing for you to worry about. Well, it's open source, though. It's well, every, everybody's job. Just pull request. Yes, quite. Yes, yes. I forget, <laughs> I forget that. So. On to agents. So agents are these collections of aspects, right? Yeah. That's, that's the easiest thing to imagine them as. So, and, and this is what gives us the, the ability to, to pull information from these different systems and to, to, to provide the and gives us the hooks. So we have ACA. You know, so we're able to, as, we, as we've, we've spoken about ACA, you can monitor actor instances, their performance, failures, messages, the queues, the threads, the, the mean time in, in the on receive. Um, also, got, we've got um, the ability to measure spray, uh, you know, HTTP requests, the number of bytes transferred. And also play. Um, measuring the HTTP requests, again, performance controlling. And with spray, remember, it's built on top of ACA, so you get right, absolutely. all of the ACA stuff as well as the spray stuff. Um, so that's good. So the agents are, uh, yeah, a collection of aspects, as we said. Um, and they instrument the interesting methods interesting <laughs> um, in their target and report out information um, that's configured in the output module. So a little bit more information on the ACA agent. So we found some interesting points to, to, to monitor and give us a bit more insight. So as we said from the previous slides, we wanted to see, you know, ma mailbox size, messages, mail time, uh, mean time in, in mailbox, exceptions, um, you know, pro uh, execute a thread data. You know, the instrumentation around the specific ACA inter inter interactions. That's a tough one. Um, a bit more about the play framework. So, yeah, we, again, we looked at the, um, what our client wanted, really, and that was the 
how much uh, you know, volume is coming through their HTTP uh, endpoints in play. So we get to see HTTP, <laughs> HTTP requests grouped by, by root. Uh, and also any errors, exceptions. Sure. And the last one, so Spray. So again, we, um, we wanted to do a little bit on Spray to sort of complete the package. Um, so we've got HTTP requests, um, overall request processing time, um, you know, request count grouped by root, mm -hmm. errors exceptions, you know, and... And we added the marshallers. We found that for a lot of our work, the, the clients at the end of our requests were using SOAP and big fat HTML request responses. So we added the impact of the marshallers and unmarshallers. And that was an eye opener as well. That we spent a lot of time processing SML. But anyway, that, that's, that's by the by. We have three output modules. Um, we started with StatsD, with Datadog extensions, but you know, don't get too hung up on a particular implementation or a particular client that receives it. Mm -hmm. This is actually standard boring StatsD. We'll get to what, what that is in just a minute. We have Dtrace, which runs beautifully well on Solaris. Does anyone run Solaris? Yay, fantastic. So we have Dtrace, so you can actually plug in a probe that gets activated when something happens in your, in your actor system. It's brilliant. And we have Codahel metrics output module. Again, if anyone has any ideas, any suggestions for anything else, we'll, we'll either have a go and implement it ourselves, or if you want to have a go, by all means, send a pull request. So StatsD, it's a real simple protocol, right? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's lightweight, UDP-based. Um, you know, it sends tracing information to anything that can uh, understand the datagrams. You know, the datagrams carry a very specific, you know, they're just very specifically formatted strings. Um, you know, hence Datadog, so sorry for people who haven't heard of Datadog, it's just a, a software as a service online sort of mon like it graphing tool. Charts it, it does nice, and nice graphs stuff. and stuff and it gives you some, some history of, of data, but there's lots of alternatives, sort of Graphite and um, d oh, Google, <laughs> Google them. <laughs> well, Google, oh, okay, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, yeah, so, you know, the, if we look a bit more closely at the... Uh, at, the, at the string. So the type can either be um, a, a C for count, so this is for increments and decrements. Um, the, uh, the other type is uh, G for gauge, so this is a, an absolute value. Um, so imagine I have five running threads, right? That's an absolute value, and then one more count, I have one more message received, or I have one more exception, that sort of thing. Um, and milliseconds for execution time, so, sure. you know, how long mean time in, in uh, being executed. Right. So you know, we can get away with this. Uh, you know, the minimum MTU on the internet is uh, 576, and the size of the IP4 header is almost 60 bytes, and the UDP header is another 8 bytes. So this leaves us 508 bytes, if my maths and my notes are right, <laughs> um, available for the monitoring data. So we've got enough um, capacity there. Absolutely, so. and the message that we send out looks sort of like this. So imagine that. So we have an ACA actor delivered the value is 50, so we're incrementing the counter by 50. We have 50 messages that have arrived into our actor, and we tag the value, so we can then group the messages by, say, actor path, an actor instance. So you might want to have many different actors of the same type pointed at different paths in, in your actor system. And this will allow you to do all the grouping, anything that you want in the monitoring tool. So you can then construct your dashboards and alerts to your heart's content. Uh, another example, of course, is another delivered integer. So we can group by message types. So not only have we, do we have 50 messages of some kind, but we have 50 specifically integers, the short class name of the thing that we've received. And uh, you know, it took 99 milliseconds to execute the receive method of actor at aka default user x of type x actor. So all that we can receive, and then it's up to anything else that you use to analyze this data. Okay, um, it, it looks like this. It has some, you know, can get some pretty charts out of it. And in fact, we may have a demo as well. Hmm. We'll, we'll give it a go, live demo. Super simple to implement. So we'll, we'll you know, we'll quickly run through some of the other, the other things and we'll, uh, we'll yeah, see absolutely. what we can do. Interestingly, um, internally, when we were designing this monitoring tool, the, the main motivation after having experienced TypeSafe Console is that the monitoring tool has to be the last man standing, right? You don't want your actor system to be killed by the monitoring tool. So we isolated the, the IO of the monitoring stuff. The, 
the aspect J, the instrumented code, unfortunately has to happen inside the system being monitored. There's no escaping. But what is being delivered is actually completely asynchronous and completely non-blocking. So this isn't nearly the everything that you have to write to send a Datadog mess or rather StatsD message out. So it's Aka.io, simple UDP sender. We receive a message, we start the UDP sender, and then when we receive a StatsD statistic, so that's the gauge counter execution time, we just construct it. Okay, the one thing I'm not showing is how to construct the actual UDP string, but I'm sure that that's actually easy to imagine. And then we bang it to the remote. So this is something that hopefully listens at the end that can receive these datagrams and understand them. So it's completely isolated. Yeah. That's one of the key things. And it's also noteworthy that you know, the datagrams are sent over UDP, so even at a low level, it's, it's not blocking, you know, as the StatsD client is not waiting for any hack of the messages. So in summary, you know, StatsD is lightweight. Um, it's really, really simple. Um, the first implementation of the StatsD um, spec was like 137 lines long. So um, that's a good indication that it's pretty lightweight. Um, and it's widely supported, but they are graphite. Um, Anything else? And yeah, that, that, that's, they've escaped me, but there's lots of others. Okay, D-Trace was a little more interesting. So there are actually ports for D-Trace. So this is a kernel level debugging tool, lightweight message delivery. And just to cut short, you can attach probes to the end of these messages. So here's, I've listed all the probes uh, on a Solaris VM. I thought, well, what can I get? And you can get all sorts of things. Amongst others, you can get the output from our Java tracing. So this is from the Akka monitor. Now the number at the end of it, so Akka is the provider name, and the number behind it is the PID of the process that generates these messages. So you can say, okay, give me all execution times from an Akka system that's running in a Java process of PID, that one. And then you can write scripts, D scripts in a, in a D language, which is sort of like C, but, but far better, right? Because it's D. Um, and you can define your actions that happen when these counters change, or when these probes change value. So here's a really, really trivial example um, of how we made it, uh, made it happen, first of all. Um, these are private APIs. So this is when you're using the hotspot JVM, or the, we tried it, in fact, on the Oracle JVM and on OpenJDK. And this has stayed the same in 1.6, 1.7, now 1.8. But unfortunately, outside of Solaris, the, you do not get a proper implementation. You get a null interface, a dummy interface. So if you're running it on OS 10, which is what we've tried, and on Linux, it doesn't actually output the data, even though we thought on OS 10 it would work. So in, in any case, what is interesting to note is that we are sending not just the string, which is the text that we're sending. This is the Akka actor at a given path. We also have to indicate the length of the string. Remember, this goes from your application into kernel space, and you need to copy it back in in your D program, sort of like this. But you have to know how many bytes you're going to be copying, because you can't just say, well, I'm going to copy this string starting at this pointer. Well, how far do you go? So imagine all the, all the mess that would happen if your actors had UTF-8 names. All, all of a sudden, you'd have to worry about encoding in these strings. You'd have to worry about variable length strings. So, you know, keep your actor names simple. Nice little ASCII. That, that's quite good if you want to use dtrace. Otherwise, sec faults all the way. So you write this program, and then right at the bottom, you run it. Like so, you attach the script D to a PID of the Java process, and then whenever the value of the probe changes, your code happens, and you get to decide what to do in that code. So just like we don't care about what you do with the charts in StatsD, we don't care about what you do with the probes in StatsD. StatsD? D-trace. <laughs> and finally, we yeah. have code hell metrics. So yeah, I'm sure lots of people have heard. This is the more popular one. It's been around for a long time, widely supported in the Java community as well. Um, and also now has a Scala, um, Scala version. So. You know, you can expose the data um, using Gangular, StatsD. Um, ironically, you could go to <laughs> you could go to Code Hell and then output back to StatsD if you wanted to. I'm not, mm. I can't think of a reason, but you could possibly do that. Um, you can output to CSV files. Um, you have the JMX, your JMX monitor, the graphing, the graphical interface for the JMX monitor. 
Um, you could, it's also got a HTTP web interface. I'm not too sure. I've been, I, I used that for a while. Well, you you have to pull in a dependency, yeah. and then the code hell monitor would actually expose all the data it collected over its own HTTP interface. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it's very flexible. We think you know with those we should have covered a fair amount of pushing data out to somewhere that would create a report. We think so. And, and the output to, to write to Code of Hell metrics is actually really, really, really simple. We use its metric registry, its name marshaller. So how do we record a particular value? How do we name it? Where does it go? And then to record execution time is to simply write the value out. There's, there's really nothing to it. OK, all right, all right, moving on swiftly. To get these actors and outputs configured, we need to write configuration files. Yeah, so you know we need to look at um, as we like we alluded to before. You, know, you can't monitor everything. You know, if you try to monitor everything, we will have created the type of safe console. Even though there's ability to restrict it, you're still you're going to be in a bit of a mess. So you want to monitor the bare minimum that you need to, and, and you can sort of accept that risk. Um, so you, you identify the the actors you want to monitor. You know, and how to aggregate the monitoring data, and then where that data is delivered. Absolutely, right? So on the simplest level, there are two files at known locations that you have to write. You have to give enough configuration for, to the agent. You have to give enough configuration for the output module. Mm -hmm. So the agent needs to know where it's going to go, which is the output module. And it also needs to know which actors to monitor. So you might want to filter out some of the actors that you are not interested in recording the data for. So if we have a little look at uh, yeah. this example. So it follows the, you know, the... Uh, configuration sort of standards, so it should all look familiar to everybody. Um, you can see in this, in this particular example, we're gonna, we've chosen uh, the statsd as the output class, and we've decided to include our simple actor. And you can see there that we support a few different uh, mechanisms. There's the, the full actor path, there's the actor reference. It also uh, supports regex, so you can, yeah. you know, find, uh, should be able to identify your actor in, in many different ways and find it from the stack. Um, another important section at the bottom is the sampling rate. So, um, again, you know, recording all this information it takes up resource, takes up time. Um, so we give the ability to, to say, you know, if you do messages, I only do it once every five. Um, but of course, we don't lose the four messages in the meantime, right? So if we receive one message and the sampling rate is five, then we sort of leave out the message for the next four, but then we increment by five for the next message that arrives. We're just restricting the amount of traffic. Yeah. And uh, we never drop exceptions. Yeah. You so get to hear about them in any case. OK, the, the, the output configuration is actually also pretty simple. Depending on which agent you decide to use, you have to provide enough configuration to get it going. I don't think there's any more to say about that. Really, yeah, I there? think it's probably almost time. Let, let's, let's dive yeah. in into battle, I think, is the um, it's time. Let's see what you need to do. So feeling brave, so let, let's do a live coding. It's dead simple. Um, we've got just a really simple um, uh, demo application that we'll mm -hmm. show you in a minute. And we'll go through and add the dependencies that you need right. uh, and the configuration files, of course. So if you are starting from a blank Akka app, these are the steps that you have to follow. And you're, you're, you're ready to go. Nothing more to it. All right, let's go. So we have a simple actor system. A system. Well, it's, it's a foo actor and a bar actor, right? Keeping, keeping up with the tradition, and we'll be sending ints between each other. But I wonder, just looking at this image, and even looking at the code that we're going to show you in a minute, I wonder, do, can anyone imagine what sort of performance this will have? Will there be any performance problems, say, at the foo actor or the bar actor? What will the queues look like? And I think the point I'm trying to make is that it's actually really, really hard to imagine just by either reading the code or by trying it out in a small test, and you know it works in dev. Of course it does, because I'm going to send it five messages, no problem. What if I send it 10,000 messages? So we'll see that, well, right now. So let's get the code in. Yeah, OK. So let me adjust. We're on a, here we go. I have to type on this screen and look on that screen, so bear with me. And I'll I'm do sure. the running comment. <laughs> OK, so let's flick to our favorite IntelliJ. So you need to drag it onto the other screen, Alex. Ah, uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> I can. I can see it's all going well. Oh, Hang on. is that full screen? Is that what the yeah. problem is? Yep. Ah, what? Nearly. Nearly. Hmm. I do want me to try. Right. 
be rather embarrassing, no, isn't no, no. it? Uh, okay. if, if you do, hang on. Where am I? It's a Chrome special. There we go. All right, uh, we should be good to go see. now. Fantastic. There it is. Well, that, that was the first part of the demo, right? Well, there we go, yeah. Um, if I hide that, that's, that's, that's very big, isn't it? I, I hope everyone can see that from the back. Are you okay? <laughs> I mean, just a bit, bit bigger, maybe? Oh, well, we'll, we'll give it a go. <laughs> we'll give it a go. Okay, so um, let's start with... Um, <laughs> this is going to be interesting. <laughs> um, creating a... Oh, where did my project go? Uh, my goodness, this is difficult. Um, that one, does that do it? There, there we go. go. There okay, okay. So, yeah, let's start by creating the AOP XML. So, here we're going to um, tell uh, the SPICJ what to, what to weave in and what to, what to monitor. So, very quickly, we can go to um, resources inside source main resources. We'll create a new file called AOP.XML. Bit of luck. Go on, we'll add it to Git. Why not? And then, yeah, as you would expect. So we'll do aspect J. Right. So, so this allows us to configure to say which agents we want to pull in. So we've added the dependencies to SBT, or we will do in just a minute. And now we have to. That's not enough, right? Because we want to give you the control. Say, where do we want to? What do we want to weave in? And so you have to write this um, AOP XML file that specifies the aspects that will instrument your bytecode. So one of them is, well, this is a long package name, so we'll be doing the aspect actor cell monitoring aspect. Isn't there an ACA as well? Yes. There we go. So the actor cell monitoring aspect. <laughs> Uh, actor cell monitoring uh, aspect. Okay, that seems reasonable. And we can pull in all the other agents. So this is how you specify yes. the aspects so, that will be weaved in. Yeah, so Amongst yeah. other things, so suppose we have that in. Uh, the next thing we need to say is to say where the aspects should patch the bytecode. So as the classes are getting loaded from the class loader, you know, where do we go next? So if you sneak in, Alex, if you sneak in, there we go, oh yeah. Sorry, just add the dispatch manager. Okay. D oh, dear me. Dispatch. Uh, okay, great. Hey, nearly. Yeah, close XML. Oh. <laughs> there you go. Thank okay. You the back. <laughs> so that's that. Now we need to say where to where to weave the aspects in. So how tell you what, Alex, how about instead of typing, yeah. we cheat. How's that? Well that sounds good, doesn't it? So yeah. pretend I've typed in this rather awkward thing, <laughs> and we'll, we'll just recheck it out of Git. But imagine I typed that in, and then the other, the other bit is to create some configuration files. So if we were to create um, a file in here called agent.conf, spelled correctly, um, in here, sorry, um, we would add the, um, what output classes we want to we want to monitor. So, so okay. yeah, we'd well, How about we just check, get, check out it? Right. That's probably easier. Are we doing, yeah, let's just. Uh, reactive monitor. Uh, check out dash dash. Yeah, yeah, there we go. And we're done. So, this should hopefully give us everything that we need. Sorry, microphone, hang on. Again, 
It's actually quite awkward looking at one screen and then typing on another. So, so we're, we let's might just do a git reset. Yes, let's, go let's, on. Let's just pull out the big guns. That's what we want to do. So we just do git reset. Reset dash dash hard. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully, <laughs> now is the big one, right? Has it worked? So hopefully, Yay. as All if right. by magic, the, the power of git has, has saved the presentation. Very good. So if we, it's very very big. <laughs> very big. Um, if we were to look at the agent config, uh, one, one letter at a time, <laughs> we'll see that we've got the stats D counter interface. Um, and we'll see that at the moment we haven't specified any particular actors to monitor this. So this will monitor the whole stack, which is fine for our little demo app, but you might want to be a little bit more specific in your real um, when you implement it in your own. Um, and then for the statsd config, um, we're running um, a statsd server locally uh, on, the, on the local host running at that port. I'm going to refresh every five milliseconds, I think. Um, five seconds. Five seconds, yes. Um, okay, so I think the only thing left to do now, really, is, is, is run it. Well, start the agent and uh, let's run it. So, so um, there we go. I've just on, on this screen, I've just started the... Uh, so we have the Datadog agent running, which is going to collect the stats T values and send them over to Datadog so we can, we, we can see them. And then in our IntelliJ idea, we can run the program, right? So we can run the main app and have messages ping pong between the foo actor and the bar actor. So we have everything ready, so in main, that's the next tab. Right, there we go. We can just press run or debug if we like. Yeah. Swift F9, just does the appropriate bit of compiling. We should see down the bottom here that. So what you're seeing is that the aspects got woven and we've instrumented the, the bytecode of Akka. And now we're ready to send the messages and have the actors communicate with each other. So the, the actor system just, uh, if we type in a number, that specifies how many messages will be passed between the actors. So we go for something like a thousand, some big number, yeah. so we can see stuff happening. So if we go for a thousand and we run that. So the app is now firing messages at from, from bar to foo. That's right. Foo's got some more computation going on. Um, now, let's see. We have a dashboard that we've created. There we go. I think it's this one. Oh, it's the oh. one that says Scala Days. No doubt. And yeah, this is the your... sort of these are the sort of values that we can that we can record. So click and log in. And nothing's so happening. Meet, meet oh there we go. No no no. Yeah. We're running. Look at that. Pick a dashboard. That's the Scala Days. So that's the one we've prepared. Now this is what's happening in the, act, in the small app that we've created. So we can already see that the bar actor isn't really happy at all. In fact, its queue is getting bigger and bigger, uh, even though we have 11 instances of the bar actor. So we have a dispatcher configured on the bar actor. It is receiving the messages. We can see how long foo takes. We can see how long bar takes. We can see the queue sizes. We can see how many messages we've delivered. And uh, we can see that bar really isn't, is pretty badly struggling. So if you saw that sort of thing in production, you'd go, hmm, this is really suspicious. You can see the number of threads. Now, of course, our bar actor and our foo actor just do thread sleep because it's a demo app. If this were a real app, you would be able to see something far more interesting, perhaps monitor JDBC calls or anything, anything else that you would want to see. <laughs> So yeah, this is just an example of, of some of the things you can see. Um, hopefully, it gives you you know it gives you a bit of visibility of what's going on. And you can see queues growing. You know you need to mm. do something about it. Um, and we found that pretty invaluable when we were running performance tests. It helps you sort of see where the bottlenecks are in the application when you put it under load, um, which you just don't see when Absolutely. you're you're developing on your Mac. All right. So ta-da, demo. So uh, we're, we're sorry about the delay. It's all UDP, and I bet you're all online. Tweeting so furiously. We're losing so a lot of the packets <laughs> in the way to the Datadog um, um, servers. 
But in any case, this works rather remarkably well. If you are on Solaris, definitely have a look at D-Trace because it gives you far more control over what can happen. If you want to try Coda Hell metrics, that's actually really easy to do. So, now that we have the demo, and we've appeased the demo gods, let's try and see and close this, really, by telling you what we've encountered and you know, what are the war stories that we've learned by monitoring these ACA applications. So really simply, presentation mode, so there we go. So now that everything is over, what do we know? So yeah, uh, as I've touched on a few times, that it is possible to monitor too much. Um, so you need to be pragmatic over the metrics that you choose to record. Um, and you should always sample as well. You know, don't leave it. You, you will, you know, there's undoubtedly going to be a little bit of a performance decrease, but the visibility that it gives you uh, and the, the ability to react to change and problems um, Absolutely. By, far, by far away outweighs um, any problem. So we've attached this, this monitoring tool to the system that we've built, and uh, we, we found some annoying little problems. So what have we done about it? Well, we, we looked at the entire system, and we thought, hmm, what are we going to do? We have three classes of work that the system does. There was a lot of CPU-intensive work, you know, XML parsing. That was actually a really big deal. Um, we don't pretend to do any clever algorithms in price aggregation, but there was a lot of XML parsing. We had quite a few non-reactive third-party calls, so think JDBC drivers, think any other calls that you have to make if you have uh, a message bus or if you have a logging framework that you just have to use, um, but that doesn't have a reactive driver, what, a reactive API for it. What do we do? And then finally, you have the third class of things that we did, which were all reactive non-blocking libraries that were available. So, Alex and his team um, sort of split the work, and uh, here's what they come up against. Here's what they come up, came up with, really. Yeah, so, you know, when we, when we first looked at it, we, we tried quite hard to think about the, you know, the design and the architecture, and we split. You know, we had very um, succinct actors, which were, you know, highly cohesive, and did, you know, did a set of, jo uh, you know, did a set of jobs. Um, but the problem we ran into um, <laughs> was that we'd almost done the bulk heading uh, of an application. Um, we'd logically separated it in the architecture, but what we'd failed to do, which I'm sure you know, many, many other people will have, will have done as well, is that we were still running the, the default configuration dispatcher config that you get with your startup app. Um, <laughs> so the, th the key thing that we, that we sort of ran into was the, we needed to split out um, the appropriate dispatcher for the type of work that we were doing. Um, you know, for the legacy blocking code, we, we, we tried a few different things, but the pin dispatcher um, seemed to give us the best performance. You know, for the CP t CPU intensive stuff, the, the balancing dispatcher, and the, you know, then we isolated the rest of the, the ACA stuff and the, all the reactive stuff, we isolated that in its own, um, in its own thread pool. So, you know, th there's just, the key point there is, yeah, create different dispatchers for the unruly code. Um, the guys at, at uh, TypeSafe, the, the Let It Crash, there's a great, um, great blog post there for a bit of extra reading about what the most appropriate um, uh, dispatcher pools are. So, so this is nearly the end. So the champagne, sorry, beer reception is nearly upon us. So um, <laughs> Caviar, isn't it? Yeah, quite. Um, so remember, monitor everything. Write the code. And then keep an eye on it, right? So do, just like we heard this morning, don't, you will never be able to test for everything, for every possible situation. So deploy the system, keep an eye on it, know what to monitor, know what you're recording, and then be able to react to it. Only monitor what you need, right? So if you record and monitor too much stuff, it will fail. Mm -hmm. Either the monitoring tool will fail, or your application will fail, or both will fail. Yeah. Uh, never too good. Don't, Don't wait for wait the big for boom. The big boom. Right. That's, the, that's the big one. Do something about it. Be reactive. Try and prevent the problem. You know, we've got all this, all this great software, the ability to, to auto-scale and, and, and do things in the cloud. Um, but sure. you okay. need to have the information to be able to, to perform those actions. And this should, this should help. Yep. Park your app, divide it, and then this is all we have. So, source code, um, slides, of course, are here. Tweets, and uh, one final pearl of wisdom. And we leave you with that. Anyone has any questions? We'll take them now. Do you support all of the metrics uh, reporters from Coda Hill? Sure. Uh, we only so, so the three that we do. So if you have stats, if you have something that can listen on stats D, 
then it can be anything that you... Oh, yes, anything. So as... I'm not sure we support all uh, oh, of no, them. Oh, no, we don't, actually. So there's, yeah, we do... Mm. We do graphite, we do statsd. Those are the ones we have tried. We haven't tried the JMX connector. I think yeah. that that should come out of the box. So technically, we should be able to report to the metrics core, and you should be able to attach any reporter that you want to add to it. But we have only tried the two. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. If, if you should, oh, no. I'll, So, okay, so, so the question is, do I have to do this sort of horrible mess with aspect J, or can I do something else? Can I maybe write a trait that I mix into my actor? Sure you can, right? But you would only be able to monitor at the actor level. So you'd be able to monitor the performance of the receive method, because you would override that in your trait, and you would be able to monitor the messages that you've received. But you wouldn't be able to, say, see the size of the mailbox of the actor, because that would break the abstraction inside the actor. Right, this would need to be boiled into Akka, and then someone tells me that something like that is coming to Akka. So good news, you, we won't have to do that, hopefully soon. So we should be able to replace the agents that collect the information with the new wonderful API that's coming into, into Akka. Yes, um, I, I'll get the microphone. <laughs> How about other performance measures, such as stack sizes, uh, memory, etc.? Yeah, so um, the reason why we didn't do those is that uh, oh, it was time, really. But the, we were <laughs> we, uh, our client were already sort of into using Datadog, which is why we, we chose that as one of the output mechanisms. And, and they already provided their own tools to, to do some monitoring at a low level, at a system level. So. That's why we, we, we did that. Well, that's one thing. And if you wanted to record stack size, if you wanted to trace the performance of the JVM at, say, method level, there are plenty of other tools that you could use, or you could use Dtrace if you're in Solaris. So we really didn't want to get into that game. The, the, the task was, actor system, monitor it now. You have three weeks. What do we do now? So, you know, JMeter will do... Uh, no, sorry. What's the... It's JProbe. That will mm. do just as well. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, hi. Um, so we were thinking about using Kamon for getting traces through our system mm -hmm. from the start to the database and back again. So the question is that uses also aspect J. So if we do both, will we get into problems or do you think it will work? I think it will be fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so it should be fine uh, because you can restrict uh, the volume and the impact of the monkey patching essentially that we do. The aspects have different names, the point cuts are different. Even if you had two aspects pointing to the same method, the only thing you wouldn't know is wi in which order the advice is run. Yeah. So as long as you didn't depend, you should be, you, would, everything will be fine, right? Yeah, I would think it would just <laughs> patch twice so you'd, you'd have the, the overhead I imagine. Well, that's a one to try. Uh, do you have any plans for, I mean, collecting and making sense of these statistics? Maybe uh, this, uh, I, I was thinking something about the lines of saying, uh, make sure that the average of messages in the last hours is the same as the previous hour or the same as yesterday or whatever. The throughput is roughly constant. Yeah, there's lots of, um, there's lots of tools. I mean, Graphite does a very good job, job at that. Um, and, and pulling metrics from, from, you know, this is a way to just to, to gather metrics, not really to record them. Right. Um, that, was the, that was the idea. But. Anyone else? No. no. We'll Thank take you. stunned silence. It's, it's okay. Thank you very beer, much. Beer o'clock, uh, I think. So, yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. Um,